this week, um, when I was at the preacher's luncheon, we have once a month out at OC, I spoke to Bill Day. Bill Day is a preacher, a friend of mine, known him for a, a long time, hadn't seen each other for a while. And um, I remember Bill Day, the, the thing I remember the most about him is that um, his sister died in the uh, Oklahoma City bombing, the Murrah Building bombing. His sister died in that bombing and I remember him being uh, interviewed uh, on television, CNN, uh, interviewing him during that time and he made such a marvelous response to the uh, reporter from I think up in New York City something who asked him you know how he felt now about God you know now that his sister had been killed in this uh, in this bombing and uh, surely the Spirit of God was working in Bill on that day during that moment of interview and he answered uh, that something to the effect that uh, the fact that, that my sister has died in this bombing does not change the fact that there is an empty grave and a risen Savior. And he said that on headline news, CNN, primetime TV. And uh, I was so touched by what he said, so proud of him as a Christian, so thankful to God for having given him you know, the presence of mind. Because sometimes you, know, you only think of the great thing to say five minutes after they've asked you the question, the moment's passed, but he, you know, the right time, the right moment, he said the, the right thing, even though he was in, uh, surely in great, great pain and great turmoil during that time. Anyway, seeing him you know, brought back that day, that tragedy, and uh, you know, I was thinking about those things and I, I, I thought about it and I, I realized that you, know, you don't have to go to a great public tragedy to see suffering. There are little quiet tragedies that are taking place every single day. People are suffering every single day for all kinds of, of tragedies. You know, that bombing, you know, it was a surprise. Uh, it was a crime, it took away lives, uh, many lives all at once, and it caused a lot, of, a lot of suffering and a lot of pain. But you know, every single day there are people who are surprised by the evil of disease. And every single day there are people who suffer the sudden loss of a, of a loved one. And every single day there are people that are faced with the destruction of a marriage, or the sickness of a child, or the loss of good health, or the loss of mobility. And these things cause just as much pain. They're not in the newspaper, they don't get headlines, nobody comes to interview you if your, your wife that you have been caring for for many years finally passes away because of you know, breast cancer. So nobody's going to come and interview you on CNN because of that. And yet who's to say that the searing pain of that loss is not any greater or less than the pain that the people suffered many years ago at the bombing. I'm not trying to minimize the suffering of the people involved in the OKC tragedy. I'd just like to point out that suffering is generic and it hurts the very same whether you do it in public or your, your tragedy is one that is a private in nature. And whether it's public or private, the result of someone else's evil or part of the normal life cycle Suffering is inevitable for everyone and few people see any of the good that might come from these kinds of experiences. So this evening I'd like to share with you some of the things that the Bible says we can do to suffer successfully, to find positives through the suffering that we experience. Now some may think you know, that the term successful suffering, is the name of this lesson, kind of funny if you, well, I'm using anyways, if you're driving by our sign outside, the, the morning sermon was entitled, Does Hell Really Exist? And then the, the evening sermon is called Successful Suffering. So I don't know, if you don't listen to both of these sermons, you're wondering what's going on in this building, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But some may think that the term successful suffering is a contradiction or some kind of cruel joke. Successful suffering 
is when you go through a period of suffering and even though you lose something or you experience great pain, the final result is that you have gained something as well. Now it may not be the person or the thing that you lost. It may not be a better situation. But if you suffer successfully, it means that you come out of your suffering with something that you did not have before. Something that only suffering could produce. Something that changes you into a person better able to deal with life and suffering in the future. Because you see, as I said, suffering is inevitable. You know, as ministers, elders, you know, we, we get to see people very often who are suffering. You know, in your family, you, know, you may go see grandpa and he's suffering and that's the only person in your life that you're having to deal with. But in our work, you know, the, the board in the office there, that whiteboard in the office, sometimes is filled with people who are in the hospital and rehab and surgery and death in the family. You know, we, we deal with this we deal with this all the time. And one of the things that I find you know, that happens to people is that they're surprised when something bad happens in their life, as if in life everything is supposed to always go smoothly and there should be no problems, no loss, no suffering whatsoever, and then all of a sudden something bad happens and they're surprised. Now you can feel hurt, you can feel disappointed, you can feel frightened, you can feel all those things, but surprise shouldn't be one of the things that we feel. Because suffering, brothers and sisters, suffering is inevitable in this life. The Bible talks a lot about suffering and most of the people it talks about experience suffering in one way or another. For example, Jacob's favorite son, is kidnapped. And Job experiences the loss of everyone and everything in his life. And Jeremiah is not only rejected for his message, he's also imprisoned for his message. And Joseph loses the opportunity to marry his virgin bride. And Jesus is betrayed and abandoned and crucified. And Mary is left a widow and sees her son tortured and killed publicly. And John the apostle is exiled to die on the island of Patmos. He doesn't, but he's exiled there. So the servants of God, even the Son of God, were no strangers to suffering but they all suffered successfully. That's the point here. They all suffered successfully for the following reasons. First of all, they knew that suffering was in God's plan. It's part of God's plan. It's not as if God says, boy, everything's going great. Oops, oops. This person over here suffered. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I, I had the plan going and it backfired. No, suffering is in God's plan. Unbelievers think that suffering is part of bad luck or fate or somebody else's fault. That's why uh, 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 Bill Day was asked the question he was asked. What do you, you know, basically, the guy was saying to him, so what do you think about your God now? as if something went terribly wrong with his faith. Believers with a shaky faith think that suffering happens because God loses control of a situation or that he doesn't care or that he's not paying attention. You hear that? You, you know, when you hear somebody say, why did God do that? That wasn't supposed to happen. What you're listening to, what you're hearing is a faith that's kind of shaky there. That's what, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing somebody whose faith is trembling. James said that all authority, or excuse me, Jesus said that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Him as the Son of God. This means that nothing happens unless God permits it to happen. 
Sometimes God actively does good things to bless people and we need to pray for this. And then sometimes He allows us to choose to do good things for ourselves and that's marvelous. And then sometimes God punishes His people with plagues and destruction. You know, the Pharaoh or Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the apostles were struck dead. That's God's hand there working. And then sometimes God simply allows bad things to happen. Tornadoes, the bombing, a shooting spree. The point is that whether He Himself causes it to happen, good or bad, or He simply allows it to happen, good or bad, God is always in charge. Nothing ever happens unless He permits it. Listen, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that He doesn't understand it. It just means we don't understand it. And there's nothing in the Bible that says we have to understand everything that God does and everything that God permits. He's not promised us that. It's easy to understand why He causes or permits good things to happen, but we have problems with understanding why He permits evil to happen. Now don't get me wrong, He doesn't cause the evil. He permits some to exist, but He limits it. He mitigates it. But why? Why let any bad happen? Why let any suffering take place? A couple of reasons. First of all, suffering produces patience. We know the passage, James chapter one, verse three and four, simply says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's face it, some things can only be produced one way, and patience and endurance is only produced in the fires of trial and suffering. You, know, you do not create patience, you do not cultivate the virtue of patience when everything goes exactly your way. No. You, 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 it's like going for a test, you know, for a stress test. You know, they want to test your heart, a stress test. You don't, you don't go on the, you know, the level uh, uh, you know, uh, treadmill. You'll be there all day. What do they do? You know, they make that treadmill go up, a little up, and now you're, ooh, you're really you know, working hard you know, to take some steps. What are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to give some resistance so it gets your heart pumping so that they can measure. Try to see the uh, things that happen in your life. Try to understand, it's the same kind of thing. It's like God you know, is kind of raising up the treadmill of your life, so to speak. Put a little pressure on you, test your faith build some muscle, develop some virtues. Our purpose on earth is not to get rich, not to have fun or to see the world. Our purpose on earth is to become godly and eventually live in and enjoy the presence of God forever. One of these godly qualities is patience. And suffering is the only way that a human being can cultivate patience. You know, once we begin to experience the virtue of patience, we see that it is worth the price that we paid in order to obtain it. James tells us that patience is one of the jewels in the crown of eternal life that we will receive when Jesus returns in chapter one, verse 12, he says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord himself has promised to all who love him. Another reason why God permits evil, difficulty, suffering, suffering produces righteousness. In Hebrews, just go back a page there, in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse seven, look, look at that, Hebrews chapter 12, verse seven. The writer says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? 
But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. For unbelievers, suffering is meaningless and useless and it produces only negative results. It is a waste of time. You hear people sometimes, people who have no faith, you hear them say, you know, I wasted you know, six months of my life with this broken leg, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't go sailing, I missed work, blah, blah, blah. It, you know, their suffering was simply a waste of time. But for believers, suffering is not an end, it's a means to achieve something beyond the pain and beyond the inconvenience. The writer here names some of these. He says that suffering brings us closer to God as His children. The reason for that is when we are in pain, we draw closer to God in prayer and devotion. It'd be great if we did that normally, if we took the time out of our busy schedules and our hectic you know, lives you know, to take the time to take an hour or two simply to be close to God in prayer and meditation. You know, it'd be nice if we just voluntarily did that, but we're way too busy, aren't we? Most of us. And then something happens you know, that pulls the rug out of you. Now you've got plenty of time. And you start you know, praying to God. And at first, all you're asking for is for the suffering to be over. God, just take it away. Just let it end so I can get back to my other life. But if you are, if you are blessed, if you are patient, all of a sudden, within the suffering, there comes great understanding. There comes great peace. There comes great joy. Suffering brings us closer to God. When in pain, as I say, we can draw near to God in prayer and devotion. Suffering is used by God to purify our lives of evil at times. I know it's not always that way, but sometimes we suffer because we're not behaving properly. It's not beyond God to use suffering or physical punishment to get our attention. Have you never done that? With your own kids, you know, ding! You know, on the side of that, ding, they're blah, 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 they're yakking, they're talking, they're back talking, you know, they, they're out of control and you just, tsh, the back of the head, you know, what, 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 what? Don't talk to your mother that way. Oh, sorry, Dad. Don't you think God does that too? We're living way too close to the edge. We're neglecting what we're supposed to be doing. We're doing the things we absolutely know we shouldn't be doing and then all of a sudden, tsh, Spiritual slap in the head, you know, psh, you know, I don't know, we smash up our car, we, we're driving too fast and we slip on the ice and, and roll the car a couple of times and we come out of it kind of okay and all of a sudden say, okay, okay, okay. Maybe I was driving a little too fast, maybe I'm not paying enough attention. Our wife tells us, you know what, I think I want a little space. Whoa! Psh, I think I need some time to think about us. That'll get your attention. Don't you think God gets your attention? Especially when the reason for our suffering can be traced to our own personal sins and offenses. Suffering many times makes us quit sin. I know a lot of smokers gave up smoking when they had their first you know, exam and the doctor said, man, I think I see a spot over there. Woo, there's a motivator. Suffering is a way that God will use to get our attention because we're out of control and we can't stop it. He may not send the suffering, but He allows you to experience it in order to get your serious attention about spiritual matters. We should never be too proud to allow suffering 
to bring us humbly before God because this is a primary way that God uses it. Don't be surprised, He punished the Israelites. He punished an entire nation for being unfaithful. What makes you think He's not going to punish you for being unfaithful? As a parent, wouldn't you punish your child to get their attention and to save them from doing something that is evil? What makes you think your heavenly Father would not do the very same thing? Go to Romans chapter 8, 28. Look, another, look at another reason for suffering, that God permits suffering. Chapter 8, verses 28. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. No suffering is wasted. Now I've mentioned two reasons why God allows us to suffer, you know, patience and a purified character, but these are not the only reasons. In Romans 8, Paul summarizes the issue for the Roman Christians who were suffering great persecution their land or property was being seized. Many of them were imprisoned. They were open to ridicule, plus the suffering associated with living in the first century. That was not an easy society to live in. And so what does he tell them, Paul? What does he tell these people? He tells them that God can cause everything. We always think about the good things, but he says everything. That means God can cause everything, the good and the bad. He can cause the good and the bad to work out for good. Now here's the part we get wrong. We're always thinking it's our good. It's His good. He can make the good and the bad in our lives work out for His good, His purpose. His, he is accomplishing His purpose in our lives and He'll use whatever He needs to accomplish that purpose for those who believe in Him and who trust in Him. This means that He has His purposes, right? Which He may or may not, which we may not understand, but the Bible assures us that it's not mindless chaos. God will cause everything to work for good, ultimately. Ultimately, for good. We may not see it. We may not be, uh, we may not see it in our lifetime, but God will cause all of our suffering to work for good. Hmm. The caveat is what? For those who believe. For those who are called according to His purpose. If you're one of the called through the gospel and you've responded to the gospel, repenting, being baptized, walking faithfully, if you're one of those, the called, then you can be sure, Paul says, through the Holy Spirit, that whatever good is happening in your life and whatever bad is happening in your life, God will make sure that the sum total of it works for good, His good. And isn't that what we want? Aren't we saying to God, Lord, use me, God, please use me. I, you know, I don't have this talent and I'm not that and I'm not a rich person, but God, please use me. So you know what he does? He says, all right, well, I'm going to use your suffering. <laughs> I'm going to make you suffer and I'm going to use that for something else. Sometimes we're not ready for that, are we? Joseph, the son of Jacob, was wickedly sold into Egyptian slavery and wrongly imprisoned over a period of 13 years. And eventually he learned that all of this suffering had a purpose. And it wasn't to serve him, it was to serve his family. We believe the resurrection because the Bible says that it happened. Well, the same Bible tells us that none of our suffering is wasted. So we must have confidence that God will work for good, ours or someone else's, whatever suffering that we experience. And so the first reason why the early saints suffered successfully was because they knew that suffering was in God's plan. It was within His purpose. Another reason that people in the Bible suffer successfully, they knew that there would be an end. They knew that there would be an end to suffering. You know, the scary thing about hell is not the pain, it's the fact that the pain will never end. My wife and I were talking about that, about Marty's sermon, you know, and she made that comment, as a matter of fact, as we were having lunch, and she, exactly that comment. 
It's not just the pain, it's the idea that it'll never end. That you might be in a place where God is not forever. Oh wow, that's terrible. That you might be in a situation that'll never change. Boy, that's hell. That's hell. What does Jesus say? And if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Matthew 9, 47, 48. Thinking that there is no end, no relief. Man, that's depressing and it's discouraging. It kills our hope and it robs us of the will to go on. Now God's servant suffered some pretty terrible things. If you want to read about that, go to Hebrews chapter 11, 32, 39. The writer mentions that some of his servants were tortured to death, some were mocked, some were whipped and imprisoned, some were stoned, some were like sawed in two, killed with swords, many were left to wander, living in caves, no food, no shelter, all kinds of suffering. Their suffering was different but the one common thread that they shared was that their faith enabled them to see that their suffering would one day end. Job suffered great personal loss of his family and wealth and health and friends, and yet his faith sustained his hope, and in the end he was renewed to good health and prosperity. There's an end to it. Jesus suffered injustice and torture and finally death but his faith supported his hope and he was resurrected from the dead never to suffer again. Regardless of our suffering, we know that someday there will be relief, either in renewal in this life or in resurrection to the next life. God has promised that he will give us one or the other, so it's okay to pray for both. It's okay to pray for renewal. I always do, no matter how sick the person is, I always pray, well, Lord, I don't have any control here, but if I have a choice of something to pray for, I'm going to pray for life, I'm going to pray for renewal, because I know you can do that. But sometimes God chooses something, something else. So we need to understand, as Christians now, we need to understand that whatever suffering it is, it'll come to an end. And our life is not about getting better. Our life is about getting to heaven. I still go to heaven even if my body is racked with cancer. I still get to go to heaven. I still get to go to heaven if I'm 90 years old and I can still run a marathon. I still get to go to heaven. It doesn't matter how healthy my body is or is not. That's not the game I'm playing. The game I'm playing is I want to be faithful in order to go to heaven. The condition of my body, that's a secondary thing. That's a secondary thing. You know, I think we're all aware of the fact that suffering is inevitable and equally painful for everybody. We also need to understand that our suffering doesn't have to be a totally negative experience. Our suffering can be profitable if we remember what the Bible teaches us about successful suffering. And just a reminder, number one, successful suffering requires that you accept your suffering as part of God's plan. It kind of eases the pain. Maybe not the physical pain, but the psychological pain. Many people work hard at accepting or resigning themselves to the suffering itself. This is called stoicism. You can't do anything about it, so you might as well accept it, make the best of it, even learn a few things about it. The goal here is to lose yourself in the suffering, hang on to who you are, and hang on to your sanity if you can. But successful suffering has a different goal. You try to accept that the suffering is part of God's plan for your life. And the objective is to accept the suffering as God's will without losing your faith, your hope, and your love. So many people use their own suffering as an excuse to stop loving other people. I'm hurting so I can be nasty. 
because the fact that I'm hurting and suffering gives me the privilege of being nasty. I don't have to love people. I mean, I'm suffering already, leave me alone. Other people think that suffering is a license to curse God or give up hope. And as I said, permission to be uncaring and unkind. Successful sufferers will acknowledge in humility that what is happening to them is not a curse, it's not bad luck or stupidity, it's simply an opportunity for God to develop His plan using my suffering in some way. And even in some way that I might not readily understand now. And so successful sufferers get through their experiencing, uh, through their experience rather, without losing their grip on the spiritual dimensions of their lives. Remember also, that successful suffering requires that you seek God's will, not just the end of your suffering. You can pray about, please God, let this thing be over. I mean, that's a, of course, that's a legitimate prayer, but please don't let that be your only prayer. You know, most people think the greatest blessing is when they get well and when the pain of losing somebody you know, finally goes away. During our suffering, our prayer should be for three things. One, strength to bear patiently with what, with what causes us pain or grief. Two, relief and an end to the suffering. And three, please God, give me insight into your purpose and plan for my suffering. If there's something I need to learn here, please show it to me. Let me learn it. By only praying for relief, we may miss out on the true benefits associated with the suffering that we experience. And then finally, successful suffering requires that we give our entire lives over to God. Regardless of how broken or ill or used up or sinful our lives might be, God wants us to give Him that life. How many people have I known who have said, oh, I'm not good enough, God doesn't want me. God wants everybody. He wants everybody. If He didn't, He would, have said, he would not have said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Weary and heavy laden by what? By sin, by suffering, by disappointment, by depression, by loss, by hurt. Aren't those the things that weigh us down? And our Lord said, come, you people who are like that, come to me, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We should never be too proud. We should never be too far gone to offer God what is left of our lives. People who come to Christ you know, in middle age, and I've baptized many people like that, sure Marty has too, you know, 40 years old, 50, 60 years old. Many times it's like, well, I've wasted all the good parts of my life. Surely God doesn't want, you know, I'm a broken man. I, I don't have much time left. No matter how broken it is, He still wants it. He still wants it, no matter how broken it is. Only those who belong to God can suffer successfully. Everybody else, all they do is just suffer. So I pray that if you are suffering, these things will help you find meaning and profit from the pain and the difficulties that you are encouraging. And if your suffering has been just that, just suffering, and you desire to put it into a proper context of God's eternal plan, then I encourage you to give God your suffering by giving Him your life today. And if you haven't done so through repentance and baptism, then that's a good thing to do tonight. The water is there, the church is your witness, the angels are before us, God is ready to take your life if you're ready to offer it to Him. I also encourage those who have gone away from God because of their suffering to be renewed back to Him through the prayers of the saints. Sometimes our bodies are in the pew, but our heart is far away. 
You know, maybe it's time to bring your heart back into the church. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's what your hurt is. We encourage you to do that as well. And I encourage those who need prayer for strength or relief or insight also. Our elders are here to pray for you, to lay hands upon you tonight. So if you need any one of these things, any type of ministry that we can give you this night, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing the song that has been chosen to encourage us.